Any health-related information on the following show provides general information only. Content presented on any show by any host or guest should not be substituted for a doctor's advice. Always consult your physician before beginning any new diet, exercise, or treatment program. Welcome to Accelerated Health Radio and TV. I'm your host, Sarah Banta. I'm a health coach, natural supplement expert, and a busy mom of three teenagers. I believe your body does want to and is capable of rebuilding and healing itself, regardless of what chronic disease you may have. And I'm here for you to answer your questions, bring you innovative and cutting edge technology and health solutions to empower you and your ability to reach your optimal state of health. Today, my guest is back, and today we're going to be talking about micronutrients and how they affect chronic disease, weight loss, and how it relates to physical, mental, and spiritual health. And I know that you really need a strong physical foundation to work on your mental growth, whether it's overcoming anxiety and depression, losing weight, or detoxing the body in the proper way. You need that strong physical foundation of health in order to gain the willpower to make the bigger changes in life. Now, as I live and as I learn and dive into all these health issues, I realize that there are two camps in society. One is trying to reverse their chronic metabolic diseases, and the other is trying to hack any anti-aging secret they can, both on outside and the inside of their skin and their body, um, with different diets, modalities, and biohacks. And the irony is that aging is actually a condition associated with a higher risk of the metabolic diseases that most people are trying to reverse. So in actuality, these two groups have the same ultimate goal, to reverse chronic disease, which will increase lifespan and slow down that aging process and increase health span. But what if I told you that we could take it a step further and reverse aging? By reversing aging or having your biological age go backwards while your chronological age ticks forward, then your risks of these metabolic diseases diminish And not only will you live longer, but your quality of life will improve with age. What are the basic markers of aging? Oxidative stress and inflammation. And that's why so many people look to antioxidants and anti-inflammatory supplements or diets to increase longevity. But the top two things that cause oxidative stress and inflammation, insulin resistance and toxicity. If you're new to following me, I specialize in helping you reverse your chronic disease and ultimately reverse the aging process. You can find my health articles, my cutting edge natural supplements, devices, and protocols at acceleratedhealthproducts.com. I dive into an array of conditions, their causes and symptoms, and how to address them naturally. I've put together the most comprehensive cleanse called the Ascent Diet Cleanse, and it comes with free group coaching. And you are literally turning back the clock within 30 days. It is enhanced with scalar frequency supplements to make the transition easy. There's no keto detox flu. People feel great day one. You have easy fat loss for those stubborn pounds, increased and sustained physical energy, increased and sustained uh, mental focus, better bowel movements, decreased appetite, clearer skin, whiter eyes less moodiness, less uh, less depression, an improvement in anxiety and depression, and an improvement of cellular permeability, which is the health of the cells and the cell's ability to get the toxins out and the nutrients in. At the end of the month, you flush gallstones out of the body safely, and you will be able to get off some of your medications with the guidance of your doctor And you will have a full understanding of how to heal your body naturally and take back control. The difference between me and any other group coaching is I provide the most cutting edge scalar enhanced supplements that work synergistically with each other and your body doesn't experience those flu-like symptoms. Like I mentioned, you feel great day one. Leave a comment below if you're interested or check it out on the website, acceleratedhealthproducts.com. Now to the good stuff. We have Craig Emmerich back. He is a graduate from, 
electrical engineering, but has spent the over 15 years researching nutrition and working with thousands of clients alongside his wife, Maria Emmerich. He is the international best-selling author of the books Keto, The Complete Guide, and The Carnivore Cookbook. He uses his knowledge of how our bodies work to help with clients heal and lose weight, leveraging their biology to make it easy. Welcome, Craig. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Oh, I'm so excited. And my groups and all of my coaching, it definitely involves what you have taught me over the years. You and Maria have been pioneers in this space and um, it's just such a treat to have you on. So thanks for making the time. Thank you. Well, I want to talk about, you know, the big picture um, Mm -hmm. of keto and when it first became a keto craze, it was all about high fat, high fat, high fat. And that didn't work for me. And anyone who's follow follows me knows that I really prioritize wild animal protein and low carb. And I fill in with the healthy fats and the right and the wrong fats that are a part of the issue. Some people come to me and they say, well, Sarah, that's great. I can do your plan, but I'm a vegan. And I work with them and I help them, but it it is not as easy. So I really wanted to start out with the benefits of protein and a lot of the science behind it, because yeah. the, ve- the vegan world will make you think that there's thousands of studies that are pro-vegan and anti-meat. Yeah, and that's one of the things that, uh, you know, there's so much bias in studies and so much bad information in studies out there. You know, I mean, in our, in our keto book, we started out by just laying the groundwork for why saturated fat became a villain. And there's tons of information about this now reporting and, 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 uh, art, uh, correspondence within the sugar industry that came out that showed that they funded a bunch of studies because they knew sugar was one of the main problems but they wanted to point a finger at something else instead of sugar. And so they funded these studies to find a link to, uh, to uh, saturated fat so that then that could become the villain and they would take the focus off of them and they could sell more sugar. So this is industry funding, funding uh, these studies to, to basically, you know, hide the truth. And there's uh, it continues to go on today. I mean, it's some of these articles talk about this being like, you know, the cigarette industry and how they, you know, deceived for so many years, even though they, they knew their products were bad. A lot of the, this was similar. And, it, and it, uh, another study showed that uh, looking at other studies and their sources of funding and conflicts of interest, and it was like 35% of, or 40% of all studies have some bias or conflict of interest in funding or other reasons uh, and who's behind the study. So you really have to look at a lot of this information through an eye of skepticism and look at the details and dig into the study and see what, you know, who's funding it, who's behind it and that kind of stuff. Uh, there was a large meta-analysis uh, a year or two ago, looking at all the available ev- evidence of animal proteins in connection to cancer. And they found no to very weak evidence out of 60,000 studies they they looked at. Um, And so a lot of this is done through uh, what's called uh, uh, observational studies. And this is where they give you a a form that says, what did you eat in the last two years or the last year? (laughs) And so you fill out this thing of what you ate in the last year. And, you know, obviously that's not very accurate to begin with. And, but for that type of study, any serious scientist is not even going to consider the outcome significant unless there's a 200% correlation or even 300% of a certain factor with a certain disease, for instance, for example. And, and most of these studies, you see it all the time, and it's blasted into the media. Uh, increased uh, meat intake has a 20% increase in cancer rates. In this type of study, that's nothing. That's not even worth considering. I mean, was that in the margin of error? Or, you know, was it even uh, significant compared to other factors? Like, what did they eat with the meat? You know, they don't, right. they don't uh, 
cancel out the bun or the milkshake or the French fries that ate were eaten with it. So it, there's all these confounding things. And, and uh, so you really have to look at it that way. But if you break it back down to, you know, what is in the food, what is the food made up of? I think you get a much better understanding of what you're eating and what are nutrient dense foods. What I want to really emphasize is something that you just touched on is what else are they eating with the meat? So you take a yeah. sample of what people are eating. This is before carnivore and even really keto has been, was popularized. But so people were eating these processed carbs, the vegetable oils with their meat, their hamburger or their piece of chicken, yeah. even even a Caesar salad with canola oil in the dressing yeah. and the croutons and the inflammatory dairy that's with it. You put someone on a vegan diet and naturally they're cutting out a lot of processed foods, right? Yeah, so I mean, for- you, go, you go from standard American diet to basically anything whole foods based, you're going to do much better. Right. And, and most vegans feel great for six months because they're cleaning. It's what they're not eating versus what they're eating. And then all of a sudden their bodies say, huh, I'm anemic. And I'm, I'm low in my B vitamins and I am feeling yeah. weak and lethargic and my insulin resistance is increasing. I don't understand this. I can't get away with what I was eating before. And uh, it just doesn't make sense. And that's, it's what you're not eating versus what you're eating. And, and yeah. they, they haven't done the studies on people that are strict carnivore or eating the right um, vegetables that don't have the plant poisons with them, um, creating havoc on the digestive system. Exactly. And that's the thing is you, you go from standard American, standard American diet is pretty much the worst starting point you can have <laughs> processed foods, the chemicals, the, they put sugar in everything. Uh, it's everywhere. You know, just saw another article of tea. You can't even get tea hardly these days. Any, any tea that has natural flavorings listed is most likely got sugar in there. Um, Mm. so, you know, the tea bags and those kind of things. So, I mean, it's everywhere and, uh, you go from that to anything whole foods based, you're going to do much better. And then there's also in the, uh, when you talk again about studies, there's something called healthy user bias, which is, Mm -hmm. uh, the person eating vegetarian is probably concerned about their health. And so thus also doing yoga or doing exercise or avoiding smoking and, and these kind of things where the person just eating at McDonald's might be eating more meat, but guess what? They're smoking and they're, you know, so there's all these health factors that bias the data too. Absolutely. So let's dive in. I mean, we've talked a lot about macronutrients and and, um, maybe you can touch on that as far as the, the oxidative priority of fat, protein, carbs, and how the body stores them. And then and getting into fat flux, but then I want to get into the micronutrients. Yeah, definitely. Um, we can, uh, and maybe we can share some uh, charts here when we get to that part. But um, you know, for me, for with my engineering background, I kind of look at things from an engineering mindset, and I look at the human body in the same way. Is that you know, when it's given the right inputs, in general, the human body is going to do what it's supposed to do. And it's going to provide good outputs. It's going to provide good health if you give it the right inputs. The right inputs are a lot of things. I mean, obviously, nutrition is a big, big factor. And that's not just, you know, fat, protein, and carbs. That's also the micronutrients that are in the food. Um, but also, like, sleep is important and exercise and, you know, not smoking and, you know, uh, vitamin D levels and how much sun you get. Lots of factors that go into the inputs to the body. But once you get those inputs right, generally – you know, the body does what it's supposed to do. And this is what we see all the time with the clients is if they get the inputs right, they eat the right foods, the right nutrient dense foods, they, their symptoms for all these different conditions will get better. And we see it time and time again with just about any condition you can imagine. And so that kind of relates back to this whole food, nutrient dense food approach, making it, uh, you know, such an important factor. And uh, that's where in our, um, a couple of our books. It started out in our keto book where I started doing this. I started looking at, okay, what is the most nutrient dense food you can eat? And, you know, at this time, uh, when I first, when we wrote this book, I was, uh, 
you know, thought I thought I knew quite a bit about nutrition and whatnot. And when I started looking at animal proteins versus other foods, I was blown away. And this is like six years ago, seven years ago when I was researching for the book, I was like, how do I not know this? How do I not know that animal proteins are some of the most nutrient dense foods you can eat? You don't hear that in the media. You don't hear that when you talk to people, you, you give somebody a plate with a steak on it and some kale and some blueberries. And you ask them, where are all the vitamins and minerals? And they're going to point to the kale or maybe the blueberries, but it's in the steak. And, and for some reason, we as a society <laughs> have just uh, lost that concept. And so uh, I've got charts uh, on this that we've, we've uh, used throughout our books, but uh, I think the simplest, uh, I, don't, I don't think I have them in a slide here. I didn't realize it had to be an actual slide slide, but, uh, but basically it, it looks at some of the most important vitamins and minerals. So it's looking at you know, all your minerals like calcium, magnesium, potassium, all these important minerals, zinc, iron, selenium. And then it looks at some of the most important vitamins, vitamin A, the B vitamins, C, D, E, uh, niacin, folate, all of these, I think about 13 or 14 in this chart of the most essential vitamins and minerals. And then it compares those against uh, different foods. So in this chart, I've got apples, blueberries, kale, beef, and beef liver, right? And when I look at those and I compare them, the only apple and blueberries are not number one on any of those vitamins and minerals. None of them. Mm. Kale is on like two and it's, it's mostly like calcium and vitamin C all the rest and, animal proteins beat them out. And on the vitamin C, you touched on this. I've heard you multiple times that when you're on a ketogenic low carb diet, your body doesn't need yeah. as much vitamin C. And that goes for not just the vitamin C, but in general, your body doesn't need as much antioxidants because you don't yes. have as, as much oxidative stress. So here we are on the standard American diet producing a whole bunch of oxidation and inflammation. Then we're requiring more vitamins and antioxidants, antioxidants. to combat that. And then you've got all of this waste that's going on in your body and your body's got a detox. And if anyone knows me, they know that I'm all about detoxing the, the junk that we're living in as far as the environment and our food and, um, and it, how important yeah. it is. But just right by reducing that oxidative stress, you are putting less demand on your body yeah. to need that antioxidants. And then the vitamin C also can create issues with uric acid and oxalates and, and uh, that all of yeah. that, which is a whole nother problem that we don't even want to deal with. <laughs> yeah. So vitamin C is an interesting one because it actually directly correlates with the carbohydrate intake. So the higher carbohydrates you eat, the more vitamin C you need, the less, the less vitamin C you need. So if you're eating very little to no carbohydrates, you have very little need for vitamin C. Uh, and, and like you stated, other antioxidants are the same. Um, but you know, that's the thing, at, uh, at the end of the day, if you give somebody two plates and you say the plate on the right here has the same calories as the plate on the left. Okay. But, but the plate on the, on, on the left here has almost no vitamins and minerals or very little. And the one on the right is loaded with vitamins and minerals. Micro, it's very nutrient dense food. I don't care if you're vegan. I don't care if you're carnivore I don't, or anywhere in between. You're always going to say, I want the more nutrient dense food that's healthier, right? right? And time and time again, that's animal protein. Animal proteins are some of the most nutrient dense foods you can eat. And probably the most nutrient dense food on the planet is beef liver. It's absolutely off the charts with vitamins and minerals. Um, and now you don't have to eat beef liver. You can just eat the steak. But you know, one of the things we do is we uh, we've done this with our kids for years, uh, and for ourselves as well. If you don't like to taste the beef liver, just ground up a little bit and mix it in with your hamburger, like five to one hamburger mm -hmm. to liver. You won't even notice it's in there and it'll just, it's like a natural multivitamin for your food. So it's a great way to incorporate it. And a lot of meat companies will do that for you. 
Um, I know the one that we get our um, some of our ground meat from, ground bison or ground lamb or, or ground beef, um, they have the combined liver yeah. and maybe even some other organs in there. Or yeah. I'm always a fan of carnivore crisps and that their beef liver um, is actually tasty. And I'm yeah, not a liver good. person. So yeah, there's, there's definitely options out there and, and all, all organ meats are great. You know, they're all very nutrient dense, great foods. Well, so let's go through, um, the, just the, the benefits of protein in general versus yeah. the other macronutrients. Um, we've touched on the micronutrients of, of what, you know, each food has versus veg animal protein versus vegetables. And, you know, one thing that we, I wanted to touch on that I, I, we haven't is the appetite suppressant effect that you get from yeah. eating protein and that micronutrients. I mean, cause your body's smart, as you said. So yeah. if you're taking in a food with a whole bunch of nutrients in it, your body's going to say, Oh, well, I'm good. I got what yeah, I exactly. needed. Right. Yep. And, and people will Definitely see that with, with just steak, you know, if, with leaner cuts of meats, uh, the higher the protein. Um, and, you know, I've, I've heard people say that beef liver is off the charts for satiety. Like you eat, a, even people that really love it, they'll eat a, you know, four ounce serving and they're like stuffed and is, you know, there's not many calories in that. But we see this all the time too with our protein sparing modified fast or what we like to call pure protein days where you're getting enough protein for your lean mass little to no carbohydrates and very little fat. This is a great tool for speeding up weight loss. Uh, and people in, and we don't recommend doing it every day. It's, you know, a couple days a week, but these, when people do these and they're only like 700 calories, maybe 800 calories, people will be like, I can't even eat all the food. Like that is the, that's satiety right there. Mm -hmm. And, and when it comes to weight loss, you can't beat that. But protein is, you know, the, amino acids are essential for a reason. You need amino acids in the diet or eventually you're going to die. Um, and they're, they're, uh, used for building muscle, for repairing tissues, for you're constantly shedding skin. You need new, you need more protein to make more skin cells and all the, all these things that are happening in the body. Even the, uh, autophagy is the process for breaking down, uh, aging and old, uh, cells that are getting older and making new ones. And the Nobel Prize winner for autophagy even stated that he believes the rate of autophagy that's going on in people, about every three to four months, you turn over all of your protein cells through autophagy. Mm -hmm. And that's that's without any fasting. That's just in general human population, right? So you, you need this supply of amino acids. Um, and, you know, complete animal proteins are the best source for that. You know, we have charts that we've done over the years. And, uh, even most recently in our kids book, you know, you'll see some of the uh, vegan charts that'll be put out there. Like broccoli per calorie has more protein than beef or something. Um, but here's the thing, it's not a complete protein and it's not a protein that will help you stimulate muscle protein synthesis, which, which is the whole point of protein is get enough to stimulate muscle building and rebuilding and repair there's a threshold where you get it primarily leucine. You need enough of it to stimulate uh, building muscle. I, I calculated how much broccoli it would take to get one threshold of leucine to trigger one cycle of muscle protein synthesis. And it's nine entire heads of broccoli, <laughs> nine heads. Think about a whole head of broccoli <laughs> and eating nine of those for a steak. It's like seven ounces. Oh, and, wow. and let's touch on the fact that broccoli is a sulfur vegetable. So if you have problems with sulfur and breaking those down, you're going to be extremely bloated. You're going to have a, a problem with your detoxification pathways, and you're not getting the amino acids you need to, exactly. to do that. And, and on I top of it, the, the beef is going to have more vitamins and minerals anyway. Right. So let's go through the protein modified, uh, protein sparing modified fast. What does that look like? And is this what you recommend when people are on a plateau and can't get off? Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a great tool for, uh, we usually use it a couple of ways, either, um, somebody who's very obese, who has a lot of body fat to utilize and tap into, it can be a great tool to uh, speed up 
fat loss. And so basically you're getting enough protein to maintain muscle, you almost zero carbs, and then maybe only 30 grams of fat a day. Uh, and that will force the body to tap into its own fat for fuel. And when you, when you have a hundred, 200 pounds to lose, it can be a really effective tool for tapping into that. And for, for somebody else, if they just want to speed up the results a little bit, or they want to break a, a plateau, especially if you're on, on a stall or a plateau, these can really, uh, stimulate your body to start losing again. And they're a great tool for that. Um, we, we typically say like one or one to three days a week of protein sparing days. And then if you're doing it repeatedly, uh, we, we talk about doing an overfeeding day as well, just because, uh, you know, they're very low calorie days and you don't want to be doing those too often, too frequently. You could have metabolic ad adaptation, uh, down relate, regulate your metabolism a bit. So throwing an overfeeding day, which is basically just a, like a keto maintenance day. So you're not upping carbs, you're just upping fat primarily to like a maintenance level, adding an extra four or 500 calories, and then uh, going back to your other macros. And it just keeps the metabolism honest. And how many, how much protein do you recommend for a person? Um, we do, we have a free calculator, uh, ketomaria.com. You can get to all of our information. Uh, the cal calculator goes off of lean mass. And that's what you want it to be because, you know, a, a five foot tall lean woman is going to have a much different protein requirement than a six foot tall bodybuilder man, right? They have so much more muscle to build and repair. Um, so that that's the primary uh, consideration we use for the typical person. We do about 0.8 times their lean mass around there as a kind of baseline. That, that's your goal. You want to hit that each day. Uh, and going over is not a big problem either as long as you know fat is in check okay if, if weight loss is the goal well we're gonna take a short commercial break and continue on and talking it more in about the fat and and fiber and some of the other macronutrients that we haven't touched on yet and we'll be right back with craig emmerich Welcome back to Accelerated Health Radio and TV. I'm Sarah Banta and I'm here with Craig Emmerich. Craig, we talked about protein, but I want to talk about fat because keto this, keto that, we are on a high fat diet. And my view is, yes, I'm in ketosis and my body's snacking on my own fat stores all day long to stay in ketosis. I use my protein to reach my, my, um, what I need. And I have some vegetables and I fill in with fat and to help with my, my satiety. But you explained something called fat flux so well. And I'd like to really dive into this and explain what is going on with the fat going in and out of our cells. Yeah. So, uh, you know, again, it, it depends a lot on goals, right? So, uh, when you look at it from the perspective that we do, which is you want to limit carbohydrates, they're in, you know, most, you know, sugars and processed foods and those kind of things, it can be inflammatory. Uh, so you want to limit those, you want to you, you just avoid the blood sugar spikes, all that kind of stuff. So limited carbohydrates, get enough protein to hit your goal for your lean mass. Now the only variable is fat, right? Like that's the really the only macronutrient left. And you use it as a dial. You dial it up or down based on your goals. If you want to burn more of your own body fat for fuel, you dial the fat dial down in a diet. 
and it forces the body to burn more from your fat stores. You dial it back up and you can maintain or even gain. Uh, so you, you use it as uh, just it that way. And what it comes down to really is uh, inside the body, you you always have fat coming in and out of the fat cells, okay? And you have fat that comes out. It it's, uh, comes out, uh, it's a triglyceride molecule. So you have a, a one glycerol as a backbone and three triglycerides uh, stuck to it. And you cleave off that and now you have three uh, free fatty acids. I'm sorry, glycerol and three free, free fatty acids. Now you have three free fatty acids in the bloodstream. And when you're keto adapted, your muscles will burn that free fatty acids directly. So that actually when you're keto, you're primarily, the, the, the majority of your energy is coming from free fatty acids burned directly in your muscles and tissues. Um, some of the free fatty acids can then go to the liver where it's turned into ketones. And this can supply the brain and certain body parts that can't run off of fat and, you know, cross the blood brain barrier and those kind of things and, and fuel cells in the brain that, uh, you know, they can't run off of free fatty acids directly. So in, in reality, when you're in ketosis, you're not really running on ketones, you're really running on free fatty acids. Uh, but what happens is uh, the body kind of produces more, typically more than it needs. So some of those will go into the liver, those free fatty acids. They're, if you're just sitting on a couch and you're not moving, they'll get packaged back up into a triglyceride molecule, go back into your fat cells and be stored. And that's kind of fat flux. It's the fat going in and out of the fat cells all the time. Um, and when the dietary fat comes in, it comes in, it's, it's uh, absorbed into the bloodstream. And then now it's either going to got to be used as fuel, which most of the time it isn't at that state. Almost all of that dietary fat gets packaged up into what's called a chylomicron, which is a big particle, and it goes into your fat stores. That's where the fat you eat goes, right? And once it's in the body, the body doesn't really care if it burns fat from the diet or fat from your fat cells. It can do either equally well. It doesn't really care. So that's why this dial works so well with fat in the diet based on your goals, because you dial it down, you have less fat coming in. So that's fat going back into the fat cells and you have more fat coming out. So we call that kind of a negative fat flux. You have less fat going in than you have coming out, which means you're losing stored body fat. And that's the goal if you want fat loss, right? So that that's kind of how that whole process works. And can you explain what happens if these fats are the inflammatory omega-6s and the seed oils and canola oil? What is happening with those fat types of fat? Well, the thing with those is that, uh, you know, if you just back it up at a real macro level, uh, those are primarily uh, omega-6 oils, which are highly inflammatory. And we always, you know, many people will be aware that you want your omega six to omega three ratio to be more like one to one. But today with all the dressings and soybean oils and stuff that are used, it's like 60 to one, you get 60 times the mm -hmm. omega six as you do omega three. And that becomes very inflammatory in the body and all this. So you're trying to get that closer to like a one to one type uh, relationship. And so you want to limit the omega-6s and get enough omega-3, which quality of, of your sources of food will come into play. Uh, Grass-fed beef is going to be higher in omega-3. Your, your quality eggs, your, your, these type of you know, fish and, and different uh, animal proteins will, will help improve your omega, uh, omega-3s while limiting those omega-6s. And you get that kind of better balance that's less inflammatory for the body. Right. And then if you have not... Um detoxed or taking care of your liver health because their liver is where it does all of this work then you're going to get nauseous you're going to the whole mechanism is just not going to work as smoothly and more as efficiently well what happens with the fat threshold how does someone hmm. know how much fat they should be eating yeah this is interesting it's the personal fat threshold uh are you talking about the personal fat threshold on mm -hmm. a person or the, how much they should eat? Um, cause that's slightly different. <laughs> the personal fat threshold. Okay. Uh, so personal fat threshold is, is essentially 
you know, when you're young, and people may have heard this, you, and I, I heard this a long time ago, but when you're young, you make new fat cells. And after a certain age, you don't make any new cells. You just uh, fill up or empty the existing fat cells you have. Okay. And this is really important because it creates essentially a personal fat threshold for your body. And the more, the more fat cells you have, the more obese you can become before becoming uh, metabolically deranged or damaged insulin resistance. Because insulin resistance primarily happens or is centered on the fat cells. If you have only a few fat cells and they get a, a small amount and they get overstuffed and inflamed, they get to a point where they don't want to accept any more fat. And so they reject insulin. They become insulin resistant. So no more fat can be put in them because they don't want to explode. So that's where insulin resistance starts. And, and if you only have a few fat cells and they get all stuffed, now you're insulin resistant and you don't have any place to put the fat, even though you're maybe 110 pounds. We've had several women who are type 2 diabetic that are 110 pounds. They just don't have a lot of fat cells. And in that case, you definitely don't want to follow the kind of keto guru advice of adding lots of fat to the diet because there's no place to put it. <laughs> and you'll actually make the diabetes worse even though you're eating no carbohydrates, if you're dumping bulletproof coffees and fat onto somebody who's in this metabolic state. Uh, we are working with a client right now who was given that advice. He's a diabetic, but very lean man. And he was dumping lots of fat on his diet because that's what he was told to do and not eating very much protein. And his uh, triglycerides went up to 400 almost. Uh, his A1C went up to 7.1 even though he's eating little to no carbohydrates because wow. you're not addressing the root cause of the problem. Uh, and this is also why, you know, somebody could be a hundred pounds overweight and not insulin resistant. They're just haven't gotten to their personal fat threshold yet. Uh, they still have more fat cells available to put fat into. So this really explains uh, that whole process. And it's very important to understand because it, uh, it helps you understand how to properly treat this and to, to reverse this, situation of insulin resistance with these fat cells that are overstuffed, you want to shrink the fat cells. So burn some of that fat and use it as fuel, uh, and fat, you know, getting in a negative flat flux will help you get there and then maintain or build muscle because maintaining or building muscle gives place for the glucose to go. So that's kind of your storage sink for your glucose, right? So if you get enough protein and limit the fat, you're heading in that direction. You're, you're maintaining your building muscle and you're shrinking your fat cells. And that pro that in itself will uh, help reverse the type two diabetes. So taking a step back, you can get type two diabetes from too many carbs or too much yeah. fat. And what's the fuel. one that's yeah. left? And the one protein. that's left is protein. And that's exactly. what it is really difficult to convert protein into body fat. It, the, the yeah. Yeah. Are... Yep. Body only body. Uh, like we described earlier, your body always needs protein, amino acids to rebuild these cells. It's constantly repairing and, and doing these, uh, rebuilding new skin and all that. And so it doesn't want to use the protein for fuel. It only uses the protein for fuel when it has to. And primarily that's if you're a very lean person and you tried to do something like protein sparing modified fast. So you don't have any extra body fat and you're not eating carbs and you're not eating hardly any fat, the body's like, I got to get energy from somewhere. <laughs> so then it's going to start really turning protein into energy because it has to. Um, outside of that, it's going to use the fuels it has. You know, if, if you've got extra body fat, it's going to use that for fuel before it's ever going to use protein. We did not discuss the digestive tracts versus primates. And this was something that I was blown away in your carnivore cookbook. And by the way, everybody, the amazing cookbooks and the recipes are phenomenal. But the added bonus is all of the science and the studies and the other stuff that goes on in these books. It's not just a cookbook. So I highly recommend all of them. Um, carnivore cookbook was great in talking about you know, our digestive system versus primates and what they're eating. Can you go through that a little bit? Yeah. So, um, what's, 
I found really interesting writing that book is uh, I wanted to understand what made us human in the first place. Kind of like the engineering mind of let's go back to the root cause or root uh, part of this solution of these these beings that, you know, the early humans and the uh, Neanderthals, they grew this big brain and their guts shrank. And why did that happen and what caused that to happen, right? And so we, I was diving into that and, you know, part of the thing is understanding where we ended up and that's our digest, digestive system. And there is the uh, human and that little red part there, that is the cecum. The cecum is where the body uh, would normally process fiber, right? And it basically is a pouch where fiber sits in, in animals like ruminants or herbivores that primarily eat those kind of uh, foods, that fiber sits in there and ferments and turns primarily into saturated fatty acid. Mm. A cow is getting a lot of its diet from saturated fat. It's just fermenting all the fiber and turning it into saturated fats. Wow. And so it has pouches and, and things to do that in. And it, in, uh, in primates, it's the cecum that does that. Well, you can see on a human, it's that tiny pouch and there's no, it can't really hold anything to you know ferment it. And that's why fiber goes right through us now. We don't do anything with fiber. Uh, this is what it looks like on a koala bear. That clearly is, you know, an herbivore. It's that big curly red pouch and it holds all the uh, fiber in there and turns it into uh, fats that it can use. Um, and that's, that's what happened to us as humans is we evolved from this species. If you compare us to other primates, you'll see some striking changes. And that is number one, the cecum is drastically different in size it's almost non-existent in humans. Number two, the small and large uh, uh, intestines. So the small intestine is great for processing meats. And uh, meats, uh, the small intestine on humans is about three times longer than other primates. Hmm. The large uh, bowel is great for processing plant matter and, and cooked uh, plant matter. That is uh, about a third the length of other primates. So our, our, our meat processing went up by 3x and our plant processing went down by 3x while we grew these big brains. So why would that be happening, right? Uh, yeah, of course, we can't know uh, exactly what they're eating way back then, 50, 100,000 years ago. But what ha they have done is that these ar this archaeological evidence they've been doing uh, recently is they study the fossils and they study the collagen in the bones. And if you look at the nitrogen content in the collagen, you can tell where the protein they ate came from. Was it coming from plants and what, what type of plants? Was it coming from animals and what type of animals was it coming from? And dozens and dozens of these studies are now out there showing that these early humans primarily were carnivores. They were apex carnivores, higher uh, level carnivores than lions and hyenas of that time period, same time period. So they were eating almost all large ruminants, things like woolly mammoths and rhinos and these type of animals. And they were primarily carnivore. That's what made us human in the first place. Um, and, and again, that's the nutrient dense foods that they needed to, for these brains, as well as the very energy and, uh, dense, you know, the fats and proteins, uh, to build, uh, build and fuel their, their brains. Uh, so I think that's really telling is that, you know, we, we've, this is what made us human in the first place, which is, was that these early humans ate primarily woolly mammoth. I, I think that's why woolly mammoth, primarily why woolly mammoths went extinct. They were hunted out of existence. There's been these pits that have been found in Europe. And now they, uh, another article I just saw in Mexico, they found a pit filled with woolly mammoth bones. And the so what these early humans did was they built, they dug a pit and then they chased the woolly mammoths towards the pit and one would fall in and they'd kill it and they'd eat it. And they would think about a woolly mammoth, you know, two cows could probably fill it, feed a, a typical human for an entire year. Think about one woolly mammoth and an entire tribe could eat off of this for months. Right. Mm. That's primarily what they were eating. And, and the evidence is showing that. Well, as I mentioned in the beginning of the show that a lot of people are either trying to reverse aging 
or overcome their chronic disease. And that's something that you have um, dealt with yourself with Lyme disease and which is becoming a, a big issue in the United States in general. I have so many friends and clients that are suffering from the same thing. And I actually have yeah. a friend who has it and she went through a juice vegan soup cleanse and I said, you really need to be listening to some of my stuff and maybe incorporating more animal protein. And she goes, well, I got to tell you after the soup cleanse, I've never felt worse. So yeah. my, my point is, is there's a lot of plant protein or poisons in these healthy quote unquote vegetables. And you have been able to manage your chronic disease with more of a carnivore diet. I know Maria is able to incorporate some more foods than you are just yep. because of the situation, but um, we've got one minute left. Did you do, is there anything that you want to touch on with, a, with chronic disease and what you're doing? Yeah, we see a lot of improvements with health and uh, you know, chronic pain is a huge one for that. And Lyme disease can be, like you said, such a problem for so many people, but you know, the, I think what happens is what you said is the Lyme puts such a tax on the immune system that the immune system is so depressed that it can't deal with extra toxins. And to be frank, all plants have anti-nutrients. Anti-nutrients are compounds the body has to detox and get rid of. So when you already have this depressed immune system, you're adding this load of detoxing all this other stuff just becomes a problem and inflames even more. And that's why a lot of people will see big improvements with chronic pain. They'll see improvements going to keto, but they'll see even, even more yeah. improvements going to carnivore. And what I tell people is, as they want to fight me on this point, is I'll say, well, is what you're doing working for you? And the answer is usually no. So if it's not working, why not try something else? It's not going to kill you. And then you can yep. see if you're going to move forward or backward and then make the change. Well, Craig, I'm so excited to have had you on. And why don't you tell people where they can find you and Maria and your coaching program and all of your amazing books? Thank you so much for having me on, Sarah. Um, KetoMaria.com will get you to most of our stuff. Uh, we have a blog with tons of free information and recipes, MariaMindBodyHealth.com. Uh, Keto-Adapted.com is where we sell all our eBooks and support and packages and coaching. But again, you can get, get links to all that stuff on KetoMaria.com. And I got to tell you, I, whether she's keto or not, she is probably the most... Um, amazing creative cook and recipe maker. I mean, the stuff yeah, that she, she posts and the kids involved, it's so enlightening. And you guys are such oh, a wonderful you. family and um, such a light. So thank, thank you. you. And I thank you on behalf of the whole world and what you, all of the, all the people you are touching. So oh, thank thanks, you, Craig. And thank you everybody else for joining us today. And if I can help you with your health issues, you can contact me directly through the website or at Sarah at AcceleratedHealthProducts.com. I'm happy to put together a protocol for you. And if you're interested in the Ascent Diet Cleanse or any of my cleanses on my website and don't know where to start, just email me and I'm happy to help you. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram under Accelerated Health Products and my YouTube channel and over a hundred podcast platforms um, under Accelerated Health Radio and TV, including iHeartRadio, iTunes, Stitcher, Pandora, or whatever podcast platform you subscribe to. So I also do Accelerated Health Bites, where I do short informational videos and health topics and solutions you ask me about. If you like what you heard today, please share with your friends and family, and people need to hear Craig and Maria Amrick. They just do. And if you like what you heard, please also hit the subscribe button as you share my channel helps me help more people like you and bring more cutting edge guests to the show. You can use coupon W4HC20 for 20% off site wide. Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you next week. Thanks, Craig. Thank you so much.